Cast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. This is Stacy Jones, DDA's Statewide Employment Services Coordinator. Thank you to everybody for joining us this afternoon for our monthly Employment First webinar. Before we move on to our content, I just have a few housekeeping items related to the webinar. As a reminder, all participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options for listening to the webinar. You can either uh, dial in to your telephone or through your computer. So if you have trouble throughout the webinar hearing, you might want to try switching by clicking on the appropriate button in the webinar panel. The PowerPoint for this webinar is available as a handout. You can find it and download it by looking in the handout section of the panel, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. And the handouts will also be emailed to all participants that were registered for today's webinar. And just like all of our webinars, this one is being recorded and will also be available on DDA's website on our webinar archive page, where it will also include a copy of the PowerPoint. Questions throughout the webinar can be typed directly into the question box in your webinar panel on the right-hand side. And I will be helping to monitor questions that may come in throughout the webinar and we'll answer them at the appropriate time or at the end, whatever makes the most sense. So now um, I'm not going to take any more of your time. It's my pleasure to welcome back for our third and final webinar in our series on community-based day services, our Employment First State Leadership Mentor Program subject matter expert, Sarah Murphy, joining us from San Francisco. So Sarah, I'm going to let you take it away. Okay, very good. Thank you, Stacy. Hi, everyone. Um, Sarah here in San Francisco, as Stacy said, and uh, glad to be back for the, the third um, uh, webinar. There are my buttons. Um, uh, and this one is on community based services and st structuring services and managing programs. Um, when Stacy and I were talking about, you know, what, what would be important for people and what would be um, good information to share. We wanted to we wanted to focus kind of the first one on kind of an overview of what uh, the purpose of community-based services are, and give an overview of how to how to really make them meaningful and what meaningful means. Um, and the second one was was to dig in a little deeper and look at the individuals themselves and the skills that people needed to learn and um, how to tailor schedules and how to how to really uh, assess people's needs about what what kind of training and teaching that needs to happen and what kind of skill development skill building needs to happen in, in the community um, and and how do you find uh, opportunities to do that and today what I wanted to focus more on is is more on managing um, these kinds of services because uh, as many of you know community-based services is incredibly different than site-based or facility-based um, uh, programs. Um, so today what I wanted to talk a little bit about is how to really ensure that we're using these services um, and this funding in a way that's going to really move people into the community and really help them to connect. So let's get started. So today on our agenda, what I have is is um, the uh, kind of the essential elements of community-based services and and um, kind of best practice. What are we trying to do with with these waivers and and um, CMS, the Center for Medicaid Services, is really intent on utilizing these services to to help people, you know, live live actively in their community. So we need to really make sure that that is the is the premier focus of of what we're doing with these with these dollars and hours and support services. Um, um, the other piece of it is, and you know, I'd be really remiss if I didn't say this. Um, it's it's about employment and and leading an adult life. Um, so really helping people to to get on pathways um, and and um, and to determine, kind of use it for discovery, because many of the individuals we're working with who have typically been uh, um, uh, provided these services, these habilitation services, um, it's it's just been, you know, it's it, it hasn't been employment focused. It was it was seen kind of as an alternative to employment, um, and that's not right. It's what what we're, what we're really trying to do is to use these services to figure out who people are and what they're really good at. Um, and so we'll be talking a lot today about how to do that. Um, the other piece uh, that 
we want to look at is how to develop meaningful service plans and build individual schedules. Um, funding doesn't really allow for one-on-one -on -one services, um, and it's it's kind of not really uh, sustainable. Um, you know, you can do. Uh, for, for some individuals, it's going to be necessary, but for the majority of them, they, they can learn and do learn um, ex exceptionally well in, in group settings or, you know, with their peers. Um, and in fact, one of the things that we want to make clear to them is that they can connect with their peers and they can do things with their peers. Um, I, I go across the country and a lot of a lot of the states that I've been working in have said things like, you know, why do you why do you think it's wrong that people with disabilities hang out with people with disabilities? And I have to tell you, I don't think that's wrong and I think it's absolutely wonderful. So um we have but we have to teach them how to do it successfully and how to do it independently and um and uh, not make them reliant on service providers is what I want to do. So I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about how to how to really kind of manage those community-based services and support not only individuals in group settings, but also supporting your staff and your team um, to be teachers and to really make the most out of community-based settings. Um, and how do you do that? And then how do you connect a team that is 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 all over the place. Um, you know, you've got people running from, you know, one place to another. You're not in one building. You know, how do you make sure that there's some cohesion and that people are following through and, uh, you know, that your, uh, that your services are structured um, uh, and, 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 and really meaningful and useful uh, for building skills, it, they have to be structured. So how do, how do we put that structure in place in community-based settings is another piece that we'll be looking at. And then the final piece is going to be how do we measure success um, and, and, you know, at, a, at kind of a programmatic level. Um, you don't have production quotients anymore and you don't have, you know, all sorts of, you know, you, it's not prescriptive. It's very individualized and customized and it can be very, very difficult to kind of look at how do you, how do you measure meaningful um, in, in, you know, at a programmatic level. And then I wanted to close out the day by giving Stacy an opportunity to talk about um, the services and funding that's available in Maryland and then also about some upcoming webinars and trainings that she's going to be doing um, to help people um, understand the new, the new waivers um, and what those what those are going to look like. So let's get started. So how do we how do we re, how do we help people with intellectual and developmental disabilities become active contributing members of their communities? Um, that's the big question. Um, and one of the things that we've found is community-based day services are an amazingly effective way of getting people, especially people with more significant disabilities or people who are reticent about being out in the community. It's a wonderful way to really help people put a toe in the water and to really understand, you know, that the community is a wonderful, great place and not some scary, you know, monstrosity that, you know, we've kind of been been telling them all along. Um, so historically, what we found though is that community-based activities and day services were were not seen in this way. They they were seen as a as a, as an alternative um, for people who weren't interested or able to work. It was it was it was more or less a, a kind of a dumping ground, um, you know, where people sat around and um, you know they met at the center. They you know they there were lots of puzzles or. You know, they, they had socialization hour or they had, uh, you know, a, a, um, a stimulation hour or things like that. And then they went out into the community um, for activities. Um, but they were seen as outings or field trips. Um, they weren't, you know, people weren't engaging. Um, and typically they were done in, in very, very large groups you know, 20, 30 people in a van and then they go to the mall and they walk around the mall and have lunch maybe, um, uh, you know, they bring their lunch and, and, and they're not engaging, they're not actually even utilizing the sites in many, many instances and they're not connecting. The other thing that we see is, is that community activities or day services were, um, you know, kind of sporadic ideas about, you know, what to do if there was downtime, there was no contracts in the in the work centers, or, um, you know, that that they they were 
you know used to fill fill that time um and it was and it was just social recreational stuff um or um as we like to say kind of loitering um just going out in the community to be in the community um and we used to see people writing community goals as you know John will go into the community three times it doesn't say anything about why John's going out there, what he's learning. It's nothing about skill building. It's, it's, it's the services. You know, you are providing John an opportunity to go out into the community three times. That is, that is, that should not be on John's plan. John should be learning something and he should be going to some place in a structured way to really kind of connect and, and, um, gain that experience. So, you know, typically the other thing that we saw was that, you know, services were recreational or a chance to kind of socialize. Um, most of them um, focused on on that element of life. Most of them did not focus on on employment or or volunteering or the idea of work. Um, in fact, many people saw these, as I said earlier, as an alternative. Oh, they don't want to work. We're just going to do, you know, this is a social club. Um, the other thing that we also see with community activities is they were often planned and directed by the staff. There's a, a person in, you know, that, that comes up with the calendar, the activities calendar, the monthly calendar. This is what we're going to do. And we see often that it's, you know, focused on major holidays. You know, we're going to the pumpkin patch on Halloween or we're going to, um, you know, do something at Christmas that's really Christmas oriented. So it was like major holidays or, um, you know, fun activities. Activities, um, but but it was all planned and directed by the staff. So the people in the program never learned to do that. They never learned to initiate that kind of stuff. They never learned to to actually uh, plan or do, you know, to put something in play. So uh, a big part of services should be teaching people to independently connect and do this, um, so that they're not reliant on our programming and on our staff to do this for them. So now what we see in, and what we are really trying to get um, across to people is that this is a new day. This is a new day for day services. It's not your, it's not your, it's not your old, it's not your mother's old day services. It's something new. Um, and that we're trying to use these to really connect and teach and support individuals, um, not, not to just to fill time and, and to fill their day. Um, so today what we see community day services for is to really connect people and to build bridges and villages for people in their community and to help them really become part of their neighborhoods um, and the places that they live. The other piece of our community day services is really to explore the idea of working um, and to create those pathways and to and to to teach you know what a work ethic is and that I'm a helper um, instead of I'm the one being helped, um, and a way to kind of make people proud to give back and to become a, a very valued, active member in their community. Um, and that is really mind changing and, and really um, helps people to understand, you know, what work, you know, what work is and, and, and the value, the dignity that comes from work. The other piece that we see with community day services is that it's about skill building and it's about helping people to enable enabling people to be independent, self-sufficient, and successful. So really looking at you know what do they need to learn um, to be out in the world um, as an adult in, a, in as independent or self-reliant way as possible, and and how how can we teach that? So really focusing on those soft skills and the communication skills um, that are necessary. Um, and again, the community is is very different it's, it, than a than a center-based ser service or program. Um, it's 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 you know people are people talk about it's safe and and you know it. Being in a center, it's you know people people are accepted, um, and what we find is is people are accepted in the community too, um, and very much so and embraced. But the community also has higher expectations, and what we need to make sure is that the people that we're working with understand um, how how it is that you act when you're in the community, and and um, you know what's okay and what's not okay to do. Um, so those are things that we really have to work on. And then also safety, you know, 
being out in the community um, is different. Um, and so some of the stuff that we really need to work on is, is being out in the community in a safe um, um, and, and supported manner. So, so how can we as providers make sure that that's going on? Um, the other thing that we see with community day services today is that it's it's also a way to help people stay connected. Um, you know, often when and and I often tell the story about when I started the program that I run called WorkLink. Um, we started out and we were all about work, just work. All we offered was supported employment services, and um, it wasn't enough. Um, we were completely ignoring the other side of life, and um, and people would go to work um, and they had wonderful jobs uh, and they love their jobs, but they had they were still not doing that initiating and that going out and seeing their friends or having their friends come to their house. Um, you know, those were the things that were really missing in their lives and. Um, it's because they didn't know how. So we started t teaching them how to do that and started to look at, you know, how do we support people um, who work part-time, who maybe aren't going to be working full-time hours, um, and how do we make sure that those non-work aspects of their life are in place and um, and are supported and that they can see their friends and they can go out and do um, and be part of their community beyond just working there. So community-based services, um, one of the things we were really looking at is, you know, what are the quality indicators? What are the essential elements of, of good um, community-based services uh, today? Um, and it starts out with it being person-centered and individualized. So it's really based, it's not based on what the staff person can come up with, um, but what the person wants. Um, and so that they're individualized and that they're really based on who this person is. And if they don't know, how can we help them go out and explore and figure it out? And, you know, where are we going to start? So really person-centered and individualized and built around the individual and what their interests are, not not necessarily what the, what the staff person can dream up. Um, then also we're really looking at, you know, are they purposeful and are they outcome-oriented? We don't want supported loitering. We want people going out and really building skills. So really identifying and assessing the person, the person's needs. What do they need to learn to be successful, a successful adult? And then can we teach that in a in a in a very purposeful, purposeful way? Um, and that means going to a place multiple times, not just going to some place once. This is not about field trips. It's about skill building. Um, so really helping people to, to, to utilize the community in a purposeful, outcome-oriented way. What are we trying to teach? Um, the other thing that we really look at with community-based services is, are they employment-focused? And again, we talked a little bit about that earlier. Um, you know, can we put someone on a pathway to employment? Can we encourage them um, and, and show them that, you know, working in the community, there are a million different options for jobs. There are a million different things you can do for work, um, you know, and what's the best job for you? Um, and then also looking at, you know, can we build someone's stamina and endurance and focus in a, in a work setting um, and, and really look at, you know, can we make them a worker? Can we, can we teach them, I got to get the job done, I'm a helper um, and responsibility, time management, all of those things are things that we are looking at. So employment focused, really focused on employability skills. Um, the other thing that we look at with community-based services is that they braid and blend services and resources. This is not about creating um, isolated pockets um, of, of activity. This is about really creating a real life. <clears throat> and one of the things that uh, Stacy and I had had kind of a little um, conversation about was was there's a there's some um, new programs out there called Life Course and some other things that we're going to be talking about today and it's about integrating services and and making it so that the provider is not on the hook to be the be all end all for for this individual but that these services are integrated into their family structure that they're integrated into their their support network um, that all the resources um, that that person has available to them are called in and connected and and it becomes a very um, 
seamless and beautiful thing because you can you, you what you see is is you start creating natural supports and you start creating situations where they're supported not by a program service provider but by by their local community or by their family or by a neighbor um, and that's what we want we want to use these community-based services not to be the service provider for this person for a lifetime, but to see if we can build these villages and to braid the services that they have available to them, both public, uh, you know, eligibility services such as, you know, community-based day waivers, um, but also, you know, the other resources they have, their, their support network, um, be it family or neighbors or whoever. So really braiding and blending all of the services that they have and all of the resources that they have to, to, um, to, to bring to the table. So the other thing with uh, quality indicators and, and really quality community-based services is to create something that's flexible and res responsive to the person's circumstances because lives change, um, and we see it uh, very often, and, and situations change, and people's interests change. So you have to have something that is that evolves and changes um, as as the person's situation changes. So, and this is important for the you know at a state level for policies to be easy to get POSs and purchase of services and authorizations for service hours, um, you know, in, in a quick and and uh, responsive manner, so that if someone were to need services immediately or need um, you know loses their job, you can pick them up and dust them off and get them back in the saddle and not make them sit home for six months. Um, and kind of wallow in their failure. So what we're trying to do is to really create services that are, are really responsive and that, you know, that, that we need to really look at how we're providing services. Um, uh, <clears throat> the other piece of really uh, quality community-based services is that they build those social and professional connections um, through volunteering, um, through, through um, you know, being out in the community or going to places in my neighborhood, I, I meet my neighbors. Um, one of the other things I'm, I'm uh, going to talk about a little later is, is a program called Starfire in Cincinnati. And one of their key um, tenants is, is this, to build those social and professional networks. And I'm going to, we'll talk a little bit about how, how do you do that. Um, and they pride themselves on not only being connectors, but also community organizers. And we'll talk a little bit um, of the things that they're doing in Cincinnati. Um, the other thing that we see with quality services is that they really encourage independence. And it's not about you know being the provider forever. What we're trying to do is to really teach people to be out there and to really encourage them to to um, do things with their peers and to and to be out in the community without us. So how do we how do we make sure that we're really focusing on encouraging that independence and it really empowering people? not only to direct their services, but also to say, I'm ready, I'm on my own, um, and making sure that that's part of our, our services, is that we're really encouraging people to say, you know, I don't, I don't need you anymore. <laughs> but we're, we're really trying to work ourselves out of a job, I guess, is what we're trying to do. Um, so one of the things that we, we, we look at is with our services is, are they person-centered, not, and not just person-centered, but person-driven? Are they built around the individual's goals and dreams, and, and you know, and what's the plan to get there? Um, are they built around their neighborhood or where they want to, where they want to be, um, not around our 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 center or or the 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 the, the facility? Um, and we see often, you know, people people bring people, they they congregate people, they bring them to the center and they bring them you know into the center and 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 then go out to these community activities and what you're doing is you're really crippling people because they're not they're not able to to get to these places without coming to the center or without the center taking them so we really focus on you know home base being the home base so we start from the person's home and go directly to the 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 um to the to the the community sites, so that they know how to get there from their their house, and that we build those 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 connections and that network needed, that support needed to get that person from home into the community, and it doesn't focus and doesn't center on coming to a facility site. Um, 
what are the resources, you know, and how can I best use these? Uh, and we talked a little bit about that. Um, you know, the, the the person's resources, we we often forget to look at those. And um, a big part of developing services that are seamless and that are based on the person are to really looking at, you know, what do they bring to the table and what do they have at their at their at their um, at you know on their at their fingertips. So what resources and how can they how can this person best use those? Um, the other thing that we look at is, you know, and we talked a lot about this during the last one is, you know, what do I want to do um, and what's important to me? Um, and then also, what do I need to learn to be successful and to do this? Uh, so we really look at, you know, what do I want and what do I need to learn? And that is what makes things the service is really person-centered, person-driven, purposeful, meaningful, all the things that we really want to, to encourage with community-based services. Um, again, you know, we've, we focus on employment, and I've talked a lot about this already. Um, so, you know, employment is the foundation of a meaningful adult life. Um, it is, is really one of the things that, you know, people talk about all the time. When you go to a cocktail party, first thing people ask you is, what do you do? Um, and it, you know, it, it, there's a lot of dignity that comes from from having a job and being a helper, um, and and being valued and productive in your community. So, really focusing our community day services on these work experiences um, and and volunteering and interning. So, as part of our program, we have made it mandatory that everyone enrolled is required to give back in some way, shape, or form. So, if you are coming into this service, it is to give back in some way. And, and what is that going to look like? Um, so we 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 put that up front right away. Um, you know, so there's that expectation. Um, the other thing that we do is we uh, look at, at the exploration and discovery um, aspect of our customized employment method. We use our community day services to really support employment placement and to really look at you know doing that upfront work. So the discovery and the exploration and really the skill building that needs to happen um, for someone to get the job that they dream of. And then what we do is we braid in our employment services team when we have a good idea about what that is and then connect them to the process and do the actual placement. So the community day services are really about exploring and discovery and trying different employment options and looking at different work settings and what do you like what do you hate what are the deal breakers and all that stuff you know what are the things that you would love to do what are the things that you would never do um, so that we can circle in and target in on on what this person's best job the right job for this person would be um, the other thing that we use our volunteering and internships experiences is to develop, as I said, those employability skills. So teaching people um, uh, time management, teaching people to initiate going up to a boss figure and saying, I'm done, what's next? Um, those are all critical skills um, and something that we need to really focus on um, on, on our, our, our services. Um, so we really, you know, we treat those volunteering and those internship opportunities as, as a job. Um, some programs and some people have asked me in the past, you know, well, how do you, you know, people don't want to give up being in a work, in a work center because they're making money. They don't want to, they don't want to do these community day services because, you know, they don't want to go volunteer. Um, and what I say to you is really look at those, those work, that workshop work and and the the stuff that you're doing the the pro, the production centers as training you need to see it as training and not as their job and and stop letting them think that it is so in many instances um we've kind of encouraged people to to do kind of a carrot and a stick thing and so these community day services is to get them out doing things that they really around social and recreational things so that that fear of the community is gone, but then also to really get them out and, and make them volunteer so that it's, it's part of their job training um, is to learn to talk to people that aren't staff and to learn, you know, what they're good at. Um, and so one of the things that we're encouraging people to do is to, to limit the amount of time that people are allowed to work. So it's not, you're not allowed to be in the program 40 hours a week or 30 or even 25. Um, you know, maybe it's 15 hours of paid work at the at the work center and the rest is community training. Um, so that people stop seeing 
that job at the center as a job and start seeing it more as a, a training opportunity. Um, so, so think about your 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 program and your your um, services, and see if you can if you can put some of those kind of carrot and stick things in place to to uh, to to move people um, out and into into community based settings. Um, and if you if you're continuing to pay someone and they're comfortable, of course they're not going to say you know I want you to screw up my life and get me a job you know, that I'm afraid of and, and um, you know, put me out in the community, which everyone has told me is not a place that I should be. Um, so we, we really have to start with small steps and we really have to kind of get people out and volunteering an internship or work-based experience is so critical. So it needs to be a component of community day services. Um, so that volunteering again is about learning skills, building connections and giving back. Um, the other thing that we really focus on is is that integrating the services uh, versus a, a program. Um, and I spoke a little bit about um, the life course um, uh, model, and it's really about seeing the person holistically and and looking at the person instead of you know what can this program give them. It's really about you know providing uh, opportunities for them and really pulling together all of the resources that this person has. And looking at our services, not as a Monday through Friday, nine to three, this is where they go, but as a, an opportunity to get into community settings in real time. And in your communities, you know, when do things happen that this person wants to be involved in or needs to be involved in? And let's get that person into those things. It may be weekends, it may be uh, at night, those are the things that we need to look at. We need to start seeing community day services, just like we see job coaching, as kind of a 24-7 service that fades. So we need to start looking at these services in a different way. It is not about being in a program and giving someone a place to go. So the service plans and activities are built around the person's strengths and gifts. They are really about who this person is, what are they good at. It's not based on this person has a deficit and can't can't be out there, so we're gonna we're gonna build a special service that they that they tap. Um, so uh, um, you know, it, and it's not about you know if there's contracts available or whatever. You know, the the contracts that are available are what people get to work on. Whether they like it or not, you know, we're, this is what we have a contract to do. We're going to make these seed balls. We're going to do this widget. We're going to do, you know, you're going to put these O-rings on this. You're going to pack this in a box, you know, and, and it's not about who they are or what they're about. So what we really need to look at is what are the, it starts with, integrated services really start with who is this person and, you know, what are their strengths? What are their gifts? Where do they belong? Where should they be? Um, and what are they good at? What do they like to do? not what do we have to offer them. The other piece that's really different with integrated services versus a program is that you're real, it's stone soup. You're really looking at, you know, what does this person have um, at their fingertips? What do we need to provide? Um, what can, what can, where, what do we need to look for? So really looking at the person's personal networks. We're looking at public resources, um, developing natural supports, um, all of these things to kind of get that person supported um, in their goals and, and help them to participate in community life. So it's not just the provider provides. It's, it's about really looking at how can we as providers connect all of the resources this person has and to make sure that that person's life is, is meaningful and um, happens throughout the course of the week and it's not just a Monday through Friday kind of thing. And then what we see with integrated services versus program services is that they really encourage friendships and they really encourage that independence that we're trying to create. So this is just, I think, really jarring, and this is something uh, that I have um, uh, that Life Course um, talks about. Um, and they look at, you know, program supports and services. And if you look at that big green box, that's what people's schedules look like. And then there is nothing else around. It's Monday through Friday, nine to three. Everything else is 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 on mom and dad. Or you know that nothing happens. You ask them what they did. They I sat home and watched TV on Saturday and Sunday. So you know what we need to do is really take a look at that and really break that up. And what we're trying to do is, and this is um, from Life Course, is to really look 
at you know pulling the person's personal strengths. What can they be independent at already, and how do we tie those things in? Um, how do we look at community-based public resources? Um, so, so services and and resources that are available throughout the community, and how do we tie those in? And this is where you know creating friendships and natural supports um, is is so critical. Um, and then eligibility specific services. So those are the provider services that that you know are going to have to happen on in in people's lives um, uh, for for you know some people for an eternity, some people not so. Um, so somebody you know so somebody's schedule could look very very different, and it may start very heavily with provider services. Um, but our goal is to make it look more like this, where they're integrated, where they're they're scattered about. Um, and supporting the person's life when it happens and where it happens. The next one down is relationships. So really looking at, you know, who does this person have in their life and, and how can we tie in all of those relationships, uh, friends and peers, um, family, brothers and sisters, neighbors, um, and, and community um, people. And then the last, the pink, is, is technology. How do we utilize technology um, to help the person be as independent as possible and to support their, their personal strengths? So this shows you, and if you look at the difference, <laughs> this is not what our lives look like. You know, as, as non-disabled people, our lives don't look like that. Our lives look like this. So our goal should be to make everyone's life as as normalized as possible and to make sure that they're able to really connect with their community in a way that's integrated and, and really supports um, building those connections and, and building that independence. Okay, so what we're really looking at is, 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 is working ourselves out of the picture. How do we, how do, we do that? And for some people it's, it's going to happen and for other people we will always be there. Um, but what we want is to really look at how do we, how do we build that self-reliance. And, and I have had many people come into it. We've been doing, WorkLink's been around for 21 years, and we've we had people who came into the program who I said, you know, we'll support them for a lifetime, and they have proved me wrong. So, um, so sh shut my mouth. But what we see is, um, you know, we see increased independence with everyone in the program. Um, and it's, for us, it's really just an amazing um, thing. When we start seeing, when we start hearing people saying, I called up so-and-so and we went to the movies um, on Saturday, or I did this, we went for, you know, so-and-so and I went for a hike, you know, and, and they're doing things that, you know, we've taught them to do and they're doing things without us. That's when we know we've done our job well. So what we see over the last 15 years, and this is Jen, she's a person in the program, so she's been in the program for uh, more than 15 years at this point, I guess. But she's employed. She's working at a, a, a real estate investment company um, called Prologis, um, and she works. She started at 15 hours. She's now up to 28 hours a week because as, as her employer found out what she was good at, what she could do, her responsibilities increased. What we've seen is that her day services have also decreased 68%. So when she first started, we were helping her do all sorts of things around independent living, um, uh, hygiene issues. We were having to, and, and getting together with her friends and doing things um, and teaching her how, all, how to get around in the city. Um, and those have faded. She's learned how to do that. So, you know, we don't do that with her anymore. And she does that on her own with her friends. So what we're working with her now on is, and what she's continuing to get services from us, is to connect with her project open hand friends, which these are things that you know we were we were uh, that we're possibly going to shift um, and step away from and step out of as well. Um, and then the other thing that we're looking at is is uh, planning outings with her friends because she will plan them and not really. Uh, tell her friends. So we're working with, you know, consensus and, you know, let's plan something that everyone wants to do. Um, and then uh, date night. Um, she has a boyfriend. And so one of the things that we're looking at is financially, you know, what can you afford to do? What are some good things that you can do that are free? You know, what are things that you can do together that, um, you know, are, are a little more expensive and, and then helping them financially to kind of look at what that is. Um, she, so we see with Jennifer now, she's living in an apartment with roommates. She has a boyfriend, and she's she can she can, she has she has her, she throws a birthday party every every year, and she she makes you know either lasagna or uh, buffalo wings. She also does a Super Bowl party and a few other things, and she has a, a really wonderful life. 
and it's because of our community day services. So really using community day services to build these meaningful lives and pathways to employment, and we talked about you know what makes life meaningful, and again that significance, purpose, and value is 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 part of it. And and this definition really, if we if we can't say why something is meaningful for someone, we're not going to do it with them, or. So, you know, what we really look at is, you know, how can we make our services as meaningful as possible? So building a meaningful life, what we do is we we start with their goals, their strengths, and their passions. We look at their neighborhood and their home base. Um, and we look at, you know, we kind of plot where people are um, in our program so that we can see clusters of, of individuals. Um, and we can say, you know, oh, this person and that person live very close to one another. Do they, you know, do they know each other? Are they, are they friends? Do they, should they be friends? Uh, do they want to be friends? Um, and then looking at the life domains and training needs um, around that. Um, and then again, the other thing that we ask ourselves is, you know, you're you're really building a social and professional network. You're really connecting this person to the world. So what we need to really look at is who needs to be in their world. So we use that positive personal profiling tool. Um, so and this is something that's part of our intake packet. So this is something we start with, um, and every year we treat it like a living document. So it's always updated and always. Um, uh, you know, people carry it in binders, or they we're, we're always telling them to go put that on your put that on your profile so that we don't forget it when we learn new things about them. And then we we use those to set goals um, during their their planning meeting. Um, the other thing that we use, and this is something that's also part of our intake packet with our our program, and we have the families complete it or someone who knows that person best. Um, and what we look at is, you know, those ones and twos. What, you know, what does the person, these are the skills that they need that we kind of came up with out of our own little heads. You know, what do they need to be independent in the community and and, and do they know these things? Um, so this is kind of what someone needs to learn. And we don't, again, focus on the fours and fives. We're really looking at the ones, twos, and threes. So the program manager uses these tools to really, um, you know, pulls these tools together before the person's service plan and then utilizes this to help prepare the person so that they can actually lead their ISP meeting and that they can say this is what I this is what I learned look at how how much I learned this year these are the things I want to do these are the things I want support around and that they can really take that meet take control of that meeting um, the other thing that we see um, and this is you know the the other uh, um, Another good tool for doing this is uh, charting the life course, which is is part of the University of Missouri Kansas City's USED's um, life course training that they do, and it really looks at the person in the context of their family and their community, um, and keeps you from being able to extract that person and 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 you. Know, you know, doing things that aren't going to really be valued and, and really be meaningful. So it's a really interesting approach, and I think there's a lot of people who are really embracing this um, because it's 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 who we are. We are part of a family unit. We are part of a community, and what we often see is that um, uh, services. For, you know, not because we're doing it on purpose, but but that we build a barrier between that individual and those and and their family, or we build a barrier between the person and and their community, and we don't want to do that. So we want integrated services. We want to really look at a, pe a person's life stage and their life domains. So you know, what are the things that are important to them to learn, um, and then you know, what's going on in their life, um, and where will they be, you know three, five years down the road, and how do we get them there? So Life Course is an incredibly interesting and incredibly valuable tool for kind of creating these service plans that are meaningful. And again, it's, it talks about integrated supports. It really looks at you know uh, the personal strengths, the relationships, the community resources, eligibility-specific resources, and technology, and how do you really integrate those into, into the, the course of that person's week and day. Um, it also looks at you know how to create connections and partnerships to support that person's goals in life. So take a look at that stuff. It's the, uh, and I'll and there's a resource at the end of this um, that that um, ex that uh, you can use to to um, uh, a link to follow to, to find out more about Life Course. But a really great tool for kind of setting a plan and and developing um, uh, a service plan for an individual that's really truly meaningful and that's really integrated. Um, so let's just look at what that looks like. You know, when you start really 
pulling together and looking at, you know, who 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 is this, who is Julio? He's he was he's in our program again. So you know, how can we create a service that's really about him and for him? Um, and and it's, it starts with us asking. Who is Julio? And what we find is that you know he really takes pride in being his own man, loves his independence, loves his friends. So we have to support that, and we have to teach him to be as independent as possible and to do the things that he wants. He's very athletic. He loves basketball. He rides a bike. Um, so can we teach him safe places to ride a bike? And can we can we find a bike riding friend for him? Um, those are the things that you want to do. Um, the other thing that he's he's a huge Giants fan. So, you know, we teaching him how to use how to buy San Francisco Giant tickets and go to the games. Um, the Giants also have a keyhole. I don't know if anybody uh, at the stadium, the, the back fence has has a, literally has has keyholes in it um, that people stand in line for and you can watch the game without paying. Um, so if he's got a friend that doesn't have money, we have taught him and his friend how to go use the keyhole. And um, you, you you can't stand there the entire time. So we've taught them that, you know, when they start, when people start saying, you got to move, that, that you have to move. Um, and you have to go to the back of the line and wait your turn again. So um, it's, it's it, but it's a, it's a really fun community um, out at the back fence. And it's, you know, it's a lot of people who, who, um, you know, go every game and, and, uh, and they, they actually really love it and it's absolutely free. So really looking at, you know, how do we create those opportunities for, for them, um, in the, in their communities doing the things that they really want. The other thing is, is he's really artistic, loves to draw, paint. Um, he, he really takes pride in that. So how can we make sure that he, that art is a piece of his life? Um, and then learning to live on his own is something that he's doing. He has strong family. Um, so how do we keep him connected with his his um, his uh, mother and uh, sister and and uncles who don't live in the area? So one of the things is is he goes to a computer class and is learning to email people and send pictures and um, you know uh, uh, we've taught him how to FaceTime and do other things too. So using technology to kind of keep him connected to those to people that he loves close and far away. Um, the other thing that we really look at is, you know, his sense of humor, his social, uh, he's, he loves to be busy. Um, and then he's also, he's, he's, a, he's a Christian and, and uh, faith is very important to him. So how can we make sure that he's connected to that community? So here's what his schedule looks like. And, and this is a team effort. It's not just WorkLink. Um, WorkLink supports him at his job a little bit now as we're, you know, as job coaching is fading. So his, 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 uh, his uh, buddy Matt is his job coach, um, and then we also support him um, to get together and learn. He's learning to use com the community. Um, Dolores Park has uh, some sports facilities that he's learning to use. He's learning to use the basketball court and the tennis court with friends, and he's learning to call his friends and set up a time um, that they're going to go play basketball. So we've we've kind of um, structured that a little bit and what we're trying to do now is to make them responsible for for setting that up and we're going to start moving that around in his week so that they have to start planning doing the planning part so jefferson is supporting that um and he's one of our staff people um the other thing is is we've faded we faded from he doesn't need us at the ymca anymore so he goes with his friend danny um, and they work out. Um, he also doesn't need us at his city college art class. So he, we've taught him to go have lunch in the cafeteria um, at city college, and then he has his um, he has his art class after. Um, and we don't support that anymore. Um, he is he does that independently. Um, the other thing that we're working on is budgeting and finance financial literacy. He has a job, so we're working on you know what is your paycheck, what does that look like. We're working on a personal budget with him. Um, he wants to take some trips to see his uncle in Santa Barbara. You know that's a plane ticket. What does that cost? So really teaching him you know the the worth and and you know what it what his paycheck means. Um, so Paul is 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 in charge of that um, and then also you know what does it cost for a pair of pants what does it cost for a new pair of shoes what does it cost to go to you know the san francisco giants and sit in the bleachers um, you know all of that stuff and then also you know what you know what are the bills that you need to pay as an adult you know what is your rent what does the pg and e bill look like and getting him familiar with with you know being being an adult um, on a on a financial level um, so the uh, budgeting and financial literacy is something that we're working on with them. Um, 
And then SVS is a is an independent living service that we've tied in, and and we're we're working with them on you know that the, the budgeting and stuff, so that they're aware of what we're what we do. Um, the other thing is that you know they do is is they support him uh, to do his laundry and to clean his house on Friday afternoons and grocery shop. You can see on Saturday we have a suggestion, um, and this is something that we do uh, once people learn how to do things. So we've taught him how to how to go to the Giants Stadium to pack Bell Park and 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 go buy a ticket and 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 see the game and find his way around and how to get garlic fries and buy a beer. Um, so you know he he can do this on his own. So we we now um, you know we we encouraged him and we kind of supported him to learn. And he's got a few friends who are really into the Giants as well. So we make a suggestion on Saturday if there's a game, we kind of put it on there and say seven o'clock. Give Simon a call. Go see it. Um, and you know he either does it or doesn't. Um, the on uh, Sunday is um, he goes to church and he actually teaches Sunday school. So oops, wrong way. So this is what Julio's life looks like these days. Um, he's a very busy, very happy, very engaged um, young man, and uh, he's having a great time, and he's very, very successful. So managing community-based staff, it's a whole new ballgame. So how, you know, you can see that this is very individualized. It's very person-centered. Um, so how do you put together groupings? How do you make sure that people are, you know, that that you're supporting um, the activities that people want to do? Um, uh, so and and again, it's not based on you know what what you have to offer in the in the in the center. So it's very very different. So the first thing you as a manager or as a dir program director need to really look at is do you have policies and procedures in place that really do support this? Um, you know, are your job descriptions written um, to uh, encourage and and to to outline the the responsibility of teaching and um, and connecting people um, and and do your evaluations support that it's not about production goals it's not about you know did you did you keep everyone engaged um, it's about you know did were you able to connect people were you able to to develop um, you know connections and friends for this individual and and um, you know were you able to target and find the resources that this person needs in the community um, so you you know the job descriptions are very very different um, and we'll talk about those in a minute um, the other thing to look at is work hours it's not a Monday through Friday nine to three job per se um, some of the hours because we're doing things in small groups so some of the hours you know, and some of the individuals cannot be home individual, you know, on their own, um, and their parents work, so they need a place to be, they need a place to go, they need to do some things during the week. Um, so in some instances, it, it is a little bit more Monday through Friday, nine to three, because they have to be in a group setting, or they have to be, um, they have to be, um, you know, out of the house. Um, but you know that is really something that we need to kind of look at, and you know this is this, the community day services are not respite; they're not babysitting. Um, so what we need to look at is how to how to really create kind of respite services that are more individualized as well, or residential services that aren't that don't throw people out of their house from nine to three, <laughs> um, that really are conducive to to uh, supporting someone in a realistic, holistic, and meaningful way as well. Um, so you know it, this is this is all a very much a work in progress um, as we are all learning. Um, the other thing that we need to look at is the risk management. You, you're getting people out, you're getting them independent, and then you're fading supports. So how do you, as a program, you know, cover your bases and make sure that you know you're you're dealing with and teaching that problem solving and that you're documenting. Um, that the person is independent and able to do this, um, and then you know taking care of all of the the risks of uh, you know an individual being out there, um, and safety is a big one. You know how do you teach people um, uh, you know stranger danger, and how do you teach a person to you know watch their to, um, their their purses and phones and wallets and stuff, um, uh, and then also looking at confidentiality you know how do you how do you deal with that in the in a community 
you know, there's lots of HIPAA rules, um, and that we, you know, we are under the Center for Medicaid Services for this, and it's very much, you know, HIPAA driven. And you know, you you will not talk about this, you will not say this, you will not. You know. So what we have to do is kind of look at, you know, that 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 HIPAA bubble that we put people in, and you know, it's not about their disability, it's it's about them as a person, and how do we make sure that you know that disability factor is is attended to but doesn't drive a drive a big wall in between them and the world. So really looking at confidentiality and how to make sure that staff is well trained on you know what they should say, what they shouldn't say, and how to say it. Um, also, you know, staff policies around cell phones and um, and use. Um, you know, cell phones are an amazing tool, and uh, you'll see in a minute. Very, very important tool for being out in the community, and so it's really important that staff have access um, uh, to to a cell phone and and to technology that really do support being out and about. Um, and then also travel. Travel, and we're going to talk a lot about travel in a minute. Um, you know, and travel reimbursement. You know, how do you how do you set up policies and procedures um, that really do support people being out in the community, um, and your staff supporting them? So, what is that going to look like? They're, your staff is no longer driving to the center and working, and then driving home. They are, you know, out running around all over the place. So it's going to look very, very different. So you. Program managers and administrators will have to really take a look at, you know, what's this going to look like, and and really looking at the policies and procedures that you have currently written. Um, I would guess that many of them are not going to be very conducive to being out in the community. So the new roles and responsibilities for direct service people is really shifting from fulfilling contracts and and production quotas um, and care. To really assisting people to play a valued role and to develop an identity in their community, so um, you know that is what you need to look for. That the new expectations and the new roles and responsibilities of these positions are to really teach skills and to be able to really see those those teachable moments in the community and to grab them when you can, um, and to really foster those friendships and really facilitate that, um, and and to really identify pathways to community employment and and looking at you know what are the jobs that are available in our in our community and you know what does it take to do those jobs um, and how can I teach this person um, and then really you know fostering that independence and really empowering people um, is another piece so really looking at you know what is the training that's involved in this um, is something that you as an organization are going to have to really get your head around um, you know, and there's lots and lots of resources out there for for teaching people um, uh, um, and empowering people, um, and customized employment training and systematic instruction training. There's lots and lots of great training available, and it's just a matter of making sure that your staff is well trained in those areas, and making sure that they. Um, uh, understand their new responsibilities. Um, earlier, I mentioned Starfire, um, which is a program in Cincinnati, and uh, they have they uh, they hire people in a way, um, you know, they they that's um, unusual. Um, they they look at the a person as a connector and as a community organizer. So they look for those people that are gregarious and that are are, are uh, people people. Um, and they interview in that way. Um, and the director of Starfire always talks about how he he um, he interviews people in a cafe, and he gets there early, and he watches them kind of coming in, and he watches them, you know, how they interact and how they get a cup of coffee, and ha you know, he kind of watches them in you know in in the context of you know how they are in the community, and then he asks things like you know what do you what do you do for fun, um, and if the person has no hobbies. He said he never hires them. If they don't do anything, he said, why would I ever hire them? So really looking at the person and who you hire is is really important because what you're looking for is people, people, people who are networkers, community organizers, people who um, who, who really will um, 
foster those friendships and foster those connections and know how to organize um, in the community. And Starfire is really pretty amusing. They, they, he talks also, the director often talks about how they, they come from this bedroom community and that it's really empty during the day because everybody goes into Cincinnati to work and then comes home. And, and he said that when he and his wife moved there for, at first, they were really jarred by, you know, how the streets were empty except for the dog walkers. Um, you know, that no one was out in the street in the neighborhood. Nobody knew their neighbors. So they decided that they were not just going to be connectors, but that they were going to organize the community events. So they teach the individuals in their program how to organize community events, and they make them responsible for a, a neighborhood potluck or building a community garden. Or um, one of the recent, more recent ones was they, they did a pop up puppy park. For an organ, you know, for a community that didn't have a dog run, and they had people signing petitions about getting a dog run in an in a in an area a safe a safe place for dogs to play, in in a community that didn't have one. So really taking an active role and not just being in their community, but but supporting and participating and and organizing their community. So take a look at some of the Starfire on uh, Starfire videos on on YouTube, and I think you'll be really impressed with with their community community organizing, not just connecting that they do. But that's what you want to look for. You, you want to look for teachers, not not kind of, you know, caretakers or people who are mothering or smothering, we like to say, but people who are really going to help people to be independent and ex and have those high expectations. Um, and then and, and see their role as, as teaching and not, you know, just tending this person and, and making sure that, you know, they're, that, um, their needs are taken care of and that they're fed. Um, so it's a very, very different job. The other thing that you're looking for is, is, is locals, people who come from the communities that you serve, especially if you have a big catchment area and you have a number of small towns. You want to be able to serve people in, the, in their home neighborhoods or hometowns. So making sure that you, you hire people from all of the communities that you serve is really, really critical because you want people who are knowledgeable about what goes on there. Um, the other thing you're looking for is problem solvers, people who uh, are resourceful and creative, uh, people who, um, you know, uh, really see their job as 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 that um, and who can put a puzzle together for someone. Um, the other thing, uh, you know, and we use our community instructors part of their job and part of their the requirement and of their evaluation each year is is did they develop targeted resources for people and what did those look like and why did they develop that resource? Um, so, uh, you know, making them really purposeful, making them really target in on what this person wants to learn and where can I teach that, and then actually going out and finding it. Um, and putting it in place. So that development, that community development piece is so critical. And again, that's one of the reasons you're looking for people people or networkers so that they can get out there and really talk to people. Um, the uh, other thing that we look at is, you know, their ability to be independent uh, and work with limited oversight. And I've, I've worked across the country and many people are like, well, we, you know, pay minimum wage, we get high school kids, we, you know, blah, 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 and, and you know, and we, and, you know, they, you know, it's just, they're not capable of being independent. Um, what I say is you need to look for those people who are, and who are, who are um, mature and um, able to uh, work independently because you are not going to be able to oversee everything that they do, and you want to make sure that they are in it to be in it. Um, and I think if you hire the right people, get the right people on the bus, and not just someone who needs a job, um, and be really looking for that personality, um, and I think what, what you'll see is that this is the most amazing job in the world, and we have people who, who, um, who are doing this for very little money in the Bay Area and are doing it and, and, say, and say to me that this is the best job I've ever had in my life because I get to see people change. I get to, I get to make an impact on someone's life. So it really, you know, there are other things besides the monetary element of it. Um, but again, do not hire the wrong people. Get the right people on the bus. And you want people who are going to take initiative and ownership of this. Um, Community connections are, are critical. So one of the things that we start with is really community mapping. You know, what are the resources? What are the public services? What are the transportation routes? What are the 
what are, what is everything that we have as a community and you know where is it when when does it happen all of those things are are incredibly important um because what you're going to be trying to do is to really establish connections um so the other thing that we look at is we plot where people live, and I mentioned this earlier, because we want to serve people from their homes. We want to really minimize the amount of transportation we're doing, so let's look at what happens in their neighborhood or where they want to go um, and how we're going to get them there. So we identify the service areas and the public transportation, um, and we develop potential meeting spots. So really finding, you know, where can our groups come together um, and where's a central spot that we can we can uh, have people uh, travel to independently and it is not the facility or the center. Um, something like a Starbucks or something like the community college cafeteria, um, uh, the mall, the food court of the mall, um, uh, you know, places like that where other people congregate. Um, those are the things that we're looking for. Um, the other thing that we look for is community resources or sites with multiple use. So where are the central areas where people go or congregate? Where are there multiple services or multiple things to do so that you can do something that's recreational or social and also something that's volunteering or work or employment focused? So finding sites, um, either a site specific like the YMCA, you can do multiple things at a YMCA. You can you can learn to you know personal hygiene. You can you can learn soft skills, social skills by having the person volunteer at the front desk and hand out towels and take uh, membership or scan membership cards. You can have someone working in their child care center. You can have people working out or swimming or taking their their um, their um, classes. So all you know all in one 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 location. Um, but the people may be there for all different purposes. The people that are in the group may be there for all different purposes. So really look at how to structure your groups around people's needs and where can you teach that. And what you what you'll see is there's commonalities and there's places where there's overlap. And that's the group. So we look at also resource development. As I said, it's everyone's job. Everyone who is hired by our organization is expected to develop community resources. Um, so we give every staff person business cards and we also give them um, a, a, a leave behind that kind of explains the purpose of our volunteering. And it's not just to do something, it's not time filler. We're out there really trying to, to provide training opportunities for the individual, individuals in our program. And we make it very clear that we are looking for consistent and um, uh, opportunities to teach a broad range of skills. So this little flyer is kind of a way for our our um, community instructors who are a little uh, uh, afraid of contacting or going up to somebody. This is something that kind of explains the purpose of the program in a very succinct way and helps them to kind of get the message across um, and explains what you know what we're really looking at so that the community instructors can feel confident in going up to somebody. Um, and it also professionalizes it and makes it look like it's not such a one-off, you know, um, we're, you know, hodgepodge fly-by-night um, thing. And we're not just, you know, going to bring people to to fill time. Um, it's going to be the same three people and it's going to be the same instructor who's going to own that site. Um, and, and, you know, each of those individuals is there uh, for a purpose. Um, so community-based instruction, again, it's all about skill building. So the schedules are, the weekly schedules are individualized and structured and routine. Um, and we look at, you know, teaching hard and soft skills and really collecting data. Um, so again, from home base, we're trying to teach people to travel to and from their house to the sites. Um, so our community instructors will balance their groups so that they don't have, you know, four people who need to be picked up. We need to really look at how do we create groupings that are that are manageable, um, and we need to kind of, you know, we, sometimes we start people um, and teach you know, two or three people to, to get to a meeting spot, and then we bring in a person who knew, who's who's not going to be able to independently travel, and will then the community instructor will be in charge of picking that individual up and going to the meeting spot to meet the other the other individuals in the group. Um, so it's based on real experience, real people, teachable moments, and real tools. You can't you can't simulate this stuff in a room. So it's not about classrooms. It's not about classes. It's about really teaching people um, to work together and really teaching people to um, to be in the community. 
Um, so our scheduling and staffing is really, schedules are, of course, our group are goal oriented and built to order. Um, so it's based on all of the things that we've talked about earlier. Um, and we avoid um, creating a class situation or, or bringing people into the WorkLink office to teach a class. In fact, it's, it's really frowned upon. Um, uh, our financial literacy class might come in here once in a while to do to do um, kind of some some small training, but we try to to keep that in the community setting as well. And we have uh, connections with Wells Fargo Bank that we're trying, you know, that they teach it. If we're if we're talking about banking, we talk to bankers. If we're talking about you know bill paying and other things, you know, we talk about you know what that looks like. And PG&E actually has some really interesting resources around that. So really getting out and looking at you know you know what can you use in in creative ways. And then of course we we do if we're going to if we're going to talk about price comparison, we go to Safeway or we go to Target and we do price comparison with the actual product and items that people are interested. We go make them pick out an outfit and then we say how much is that going to cost you and then how many hours do you have to work to to earn enough money to pay for that new outfit so it's all very much built on on um you know in in the community uh versus te trying to teach someone and mock this up in a classroom setting um we don't want to create that kind of school mentality either um uh you know one of the one of the organizations I was working with in Columbus said, you know, our program just looks like high school forever. You know, we have lockers here. They they come in, the bell rings and they and they go from one thing to another. And you really want to not do that um, because you're you're not teaching them to be self sufficient. You're teaching them to be okay in an academic or in a in a in a school setting. Um, and and the only people that are in school settings are elementary kids and high school kids. So what we need to do is really look at, you know, how do we teach them to use their watches and how do we teach them what an hour feels like and how do we teach them to kind of monitor and time manage themselves um, and not be reliant on, on bells or people telling them when they can when they can go to the bathroom and when they can do this. Um, so really creating a situation where they're making these decisions and they're and they are responsible um for you know and kind of empowering them as I had said earlier. So the other thing that we look at is when scheduling and staffing is you know is this an individual or a group service um you know if you can braid in individual services and have a way to fund it you know great if not um you know I actually you know, there there is some people who say they should all be individual services. Um, I I like having kind of a, a mix um, because again, one of the things I want people to be able to do is to to engage and interact with their peers. Um, so the group services, what we try to do is really foster that that group. Um, mentality of you know we're taking care of each other um, and you know we can go out to the ball game together and we can do things together and we don't need those workling people tagging along with us so the group services um, really is you know are to are to encourage them and to teach them to be a good friend and to watch out for each other and also to support each other um, in ways we we have one young man who has lost his vision and we are teaching his friends how to help him walk uh, with his cane um, and you know they're getting really good at it you know are we going to let them do it independently not n not necessarily so right now but you know we're we're you know really working with them on on how not to pull them and how not to you know yank them down steps and things like that um, so you know those group services the other thing that we do is at our our community sites we make them the group leaders so that the the staff person will step out of that role and stop assigning the t job tasks and will assign that to the group leader so that they learn to listen to their peers and that they learn to listen to each other um, and that they learn to you know d direct each other and, and um, to take that leadership role so group services are, are good so uh, you know if used in the right way and if they're balanced and if the people that are in them get to select the activities and they're there for a reason 
and they get to select the people that they're going with, um, then it's even better. So really look at your group activities and how they're developed. Um, you know, and they're obviously they should be developed around a person's interest and goals. And we use whiteboards. We have big whiteboards in the in the office that we, you know, if someone comes in and says, I want to learn to swim, or I want to learn to read, or I want to learn to use a computer, we'll we'll put that put their name up there, and then, um, you know, th that helps the staff to sort of say, oh, you know, so-and-so was talking about that, and then we'll put that person's name up there. Um, or if they have a friend, we'll say, well, you know, does so-and-so want to join you in doing that, going swimming by your house? You know, it's, and so we'll put that person in there. And when we have a group, then the, the instructor is selected based on, you know, do they do they like to swim? Do they know how to knit? Do they, you know, are they good at this too? Do they like, do they enjoy this? Or do the people, you know, the people we give the people, and, you know, who do you want to lead your group? And then that person is selected to support the group and training, and off they go. So the instructor then manages it. They they develop the resource. They figure out when it's going to fit into everybody's schedule, and then they report that to the program manager, who then starts scheduling um, scheduling the the event. Um, the groups are balanced, a third, a third, and a third. And I think we talked about this earlier. Um, so the the individuals, you know, a person with uh, significant disabilities, a person with more moderate uh, support needs, and a person who's who's just needs a little bit of uh, you know support to kind of get rolling and get off the ground, and you know, and then they and then you know we can step away. So a third, a third, and a third. If you had a program that was all people who were medically fragile who needed you know one-on-one uh, -on -one supports, it's going to be very very difficult to create a group situation. Um, so what we typically do is we try to um, uh, enroll people into our program um, and we, we have a third of the individuals and we balance it accordingly so we have a third of the individuals in the program who have support significant support needs and we'll, we'll cannot cross the street safely and we'll need to be picked up dropped off and we'll need kind of door-to-door um, and, you know, we'll have to be with a staff person to be out in the community safely. A third of the people are uh, can learn to travel independently with with probably you know some significant support around learning that route um, and learning to to do that, but but could eventually learn to be kind of more independent in traveling um, or more independent at the site. And then, as I said, the last third of the people enrolled in the program are people who just need a little bit of support and a little bit of instruction to kind of get off the ground and get this. Um, and then what we do is fade from those situations. So a third, a third, and a third, and we balance the group so that it's manageable and that you can teach. Because if you have, you know, four people who need intensive instruction, all, you know, each of them, it's going to be really, really difficult to do to be out in the community and to and to be out safely. So we really balance the group, um, and what we find is we can peel off the person who just needs a little spot check and make sure that they have a mentor and you know that's working with them. That's that's a natural support, and then the other you know the other three people may work together in a little cluster, um, or you know we'll spread them out a little bit so that the the, the staff person then rounds and checks on them. Um, and what we see is is if we spread them out and we connect them with people, people talk to them. People actually, you know, see them as as an individual, and and it's not, you know, the WorkLink group, and they start to get to know them. So we try to really foster that inclusion. And then the the you know the obviously the person who needs um, a little more intensive support would have the staff person a little closer, um, or right next to them. So scheduling. The schedules are done on a weekly basis, um, and the activities are structured and consistent. We have an air traffic controller that is, is our program manager, um, and that person is responsible for actually setting the schedules and, and organizing. Um, again, the, the activities happen again and again. It's not something that we do once, typically. Um, uh, you know, it's not a social event. So what we're trying to do is to really teach people um, by going more than once, and we use Kind of that systematic um, prompt and fade technique to um, help them to learn skills and to become confident and um, independent in those sites. So we go more than once. So the schedules don't change drastically from week to week, but there are, of course, um, instances and situations that come up on a weekly basis that need to be um, adjusted. So the program manager takes that role of really kind of keeping that 5,000 foot level. 
um, and organizing the groups and making sure that if you know if if that volunteer site is not going to have work for that group that week, you know what what can they do and what would what would be a purposeful activity that we can we can um, use in that time slot or do that do does that group you know are are people in that group able to stay home then what maybe they don't get services that week so it's it's very person by person um it's 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 you know again it's it's a discussion that the program manager would then have with the community instructors that would be involved so that air traffic controller really really important um and what we when we're when we're doing someone's schedule we start the the program manager starts with when do they work uh if they have a job or if they're employed, um, um, we plot those hours on their schedule first, and that is that is supported by our employment services team. So our team of job coaches would cover that, and it's not our community instructor. So it's a one-on-one -on -one service through supported employment that we're dealing with um, their their employment site. Um, our community instructors and our job coaches are very much in in communication at all times. So the community instructors and um, uh, I mean the the uh, employment specialists are are in constant contact with that program manager um, and letting them know you know what what that person's work schedule is going to look like um, and the kinds of things that they need to work on um, at work or things that you know are coming up at work um, and can we find a way for the for the community support uh, team to really address those in during their community hours. The other thing that we look at is what are their primary goals. And what are the things that they really want to do, and what do they need to learn, and then where do, where can we teach that, and where does that happen, and when does that happen? So we'll plot that next. Then we what we do is we set we we set in the um, the events that are kind of flexible or more random um, to fill in um, as needed. And some people come once a week, twice a week. To to some people only come in the afternoons, depending on their work schedule. Some people come, you know. Um, uh, uh, you know they can't be. Uh, they need. They live in a residential setting, and they need to be out of the house from Monday through Friday, nine to three. So we will have to do a Monday through Friday, nine to three schedule for them. So it's all based on you know the needs. It's all based on on what that person's situation is. The other thing that we have is we have a few floaters, if, and sometimes we uh, call in job coaches for uh, individual services or quick training. So if someone loses their wallet, needs to go to the DMV, we will we will spring a job coach to come in and take that take that um, person, kind of lift them out of the group and take them to do whatever they need to do. Um, so that we don't have to scramble that schedule, um, so that one-off need. Um, or if someone is out, if a community instructor is out, we can send a job coach to, to, to support that uh, um, in, instructor's um, uh, afternoon and morning schedule. So whatever it is the, the, that that instructor is doing, we can, we can slide in a job coach. We don't typically go the other direction. We don't slide our community instructors into our employment sites because um, obviously with employment sites, it's a, it's a very different ballgame and there's, you know, expectations and employer responsibilities and training and things that need to be done. Um, and you can't just walk in and, and wing it um, as you can if you're going into a YMCA or into um, a volunteer situation where it's a little more um, uh, 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 it's the expectations and the responsibilities are not so much. So, um, so we use our job coaches who are really adept at teaching and training and, and uh, really good at at facilitating natural supports. Um, and they walk into these volunteer settings and can and can really nail it. So. Uh, and they like it. They like it. It's a, it, it shakes up their week a little bit, um, and they have some flexibility and and uh, in their schedules because uh, a lot of what they're doing is that one-on-one -on -one and follow-up and other things. So, um, oftentimes we put the word out and and people um, can join. So we're really looking at how do we blur the lines between our programs um, and how do we create kind of that that team approach. Um, so our community instructors and our employment specialists see themselves as everybody's in the mix and everybody's available and, and we're all we're all in this for Julio. Um, so really creating that kind of team, that pod. Um, we we have all hands meeting. Um, another thing that people have suggested in order to kind of break down silos is a is a take your coworker to work day. So where you would take a community person or a person who's going to be day doing day services, and you have them shadow a a uh, employment facilitator or a, a job coach 
um, or job developer for a day so that they can see, you know, how do all these pieces fit together and what's my role in this. Um, this is what one of our weekly schedules look like, and, and we don't have time to kind of go through this, but um, you can see that there's a, usually each staff person, Alfred, Sally, Jeff, and Mary are the staff people, and in there it has kind of their groupings um, and then what they're required to do. So you can see Sally's picking up Chuck, uh, meeting, meeting him at Church and Market where his father drops him off on his way to work and takes him to work. Um, and... Uh, so she's acting as a that she's she actually crosses over. She's a job coach and a and a um, community instructor. And on Tuesday she's she's working in uh, at Project Open Hand. Um, um, so yeah, so that's what our schedule looks like. Um, the other thing that uh, we really caution people on is to really be prepared. Um, uh, it is, it's very different to be out in the community and, um, you know, being able to address emergencies is, is really key. Um, everything from minor issues to major disasters. Um, so what you really want to do is look at, you know, worst case scenario, you know, what is your plan and make sure that people are trained and taught the, the process so that when things happen that, that they're able to respond um, in, a, in an efficient way. So um, making sure that you know staff are trained annually, um, making sure that staff understand what the what the emergency procedures are, making sure that they're written and reviewed. Um, the other thing that we look at is you know there's a how, the cavalry. How do you bring in the cavalry when needed if something really falls apart? How do you make sure that you can gun up the staff? Um, you know that's available to help. Um, and again, that's where, you know, we, we sometimes use our job coaching staff, you know, we'll call them and say, you know, because they're used to being called at a spur of a moment and, and told, you know, get over here right now, I need you. Um, so, you know, we use our, our, our job coaching team um, very efficiently. And sometimes they're the cavalry. Um, other, other places have had um, service coordinator positions or service navigator positions, so kind of an overseeing administrative person that navigates the person through their their program services, and that person is oftentimes what they you know is is called on to be that cavalry person. If something happens and that person kind of decompensates and needs support, um, instead of scrambling that group, they will bring in that service navigator to kind of lift the person out. So making sure that you are prepared and that you have that cavalry um, all all at the ready. How do you access medical information or releases? So, you know, many people are starting to put these things up in the cloud so that people have access to them and don't have to come in here and get them out of a, out of a, um, out of a out of a paper file, um, and then also medical releases and what do those need to look like, um, and identifying you know um, escape routes and quiet spaces, um, you know in in the places that you're at, you know if someone does get loud and does get angry, you know where where would you go, um, and making sure that that's done prior to bringing that person into the into the um, into the setting. Um, also helping people, um, and we we talked about uh, at, during one of the other webinars about let's get lost, and teaching people to problem solve. And if you get lost, what do you you know what do you do? Um, so we make sure that people have medical ID bracelets and help me cards in their wallets if they don't speak. Um, so and teaching them to pull those out and actually utilize those. Um, so we we actually have a let's get lost um, group that goes out and we spin around, get them lost, and then they have to find their way and um, use their cell phones to either call someone for help as a lifeline, or if if not, you know, go up to, who do you, who do you go up to and show them your card? Um, how does this work? So that if someone, you know, worst case scenario does get lost, that they know what to do and they know how to, they, they know how to get help. Um, the other thing that we do is, um, you know, major disasters, you know, teaching people to go to, you know, where the Red Cross is going to be because we have we have earthquakes here. You guys have tornadoes. You know, what does that look like in community settings and, and making sure that people understand how to how to deal with oh, you, maybe you guys don't have tornadoes, maybe you have hurricanes, whatever it is, you know, like huge disasters, snowstorms, whatever, you know, how do you how do you what, what do you do if you are out in the community and you cannot the buses aren't running? You know, what are you going to do? Um, and, and helping people to understand, you know, what this looks like. Um, so really looking at, you know, being prepared and and in the worst case scenario, what would we do? Uh, you know, you have a million groups out there. How do you how do you stay connected? How do you make sure that parents are trained? 
all you know and and staff um you know and, and make sure that you know uh people people know what's going to happen um the other thing that we have is we have a uh, a book of plan b activities so if someone gets someplace and the um you know these these are kind of minor issues but you get some you go to a volunteer job and they and the person's not there or they don't have work for you that day you know what is some plan b activities that you can do on the spur of a moment that um are are kind of purposeful, meaningful, and, you know, good skill building activities. So having kind of that plan B activity book um, and ideas for, for staff is really important. Logistics, we look at being, you know, the, the planner, not the provider, um, and really looking at independence and saying, you know, the goal is for this person to be able to go places without us. So using public resources whenever possible so that they're not reliant on your program picking them up in a van um, uh, to to take them to these places. So really looking at you know how do you, how do you really tie in? And this is where really looking at the person's network and resources um, and and public resources, personal and public resources, um, whenever necessary. And then you know using provider resources and special resources um, when needed. So really act, you know, kind of minimizing the need for transportation is the first place to start. So, you know, making sure that you have kind of, if you if you have a program site, that it's in a central location, it's not out in a business in, industrial park somewhere way far away from, you know, what, what you, what, where you want to go, but that you have a, a little central touchstone satellite location in, in a variety of places um, where if people need something, they know where to find you. So with WorkLink, we have an office, a very tiny little office uh, right downtown on Market Street, um, and we teach everyone to, to find us here. Um, so if they need anything, they can come in and they can, they can touch base. Um, the other thing that we do is um, really establish, uh, we talked earlier about establishing meeting spots throughout your service area and your catchment area, looking at where people can meet. Uh, we look at walkable locations near the person's home and in their neighborhood, um, and, and what would that look like? Um, and then clustering participants geographically, you know, who do they live near um, and, and what can you do there? So really trying to look at how do you minimize the need for transportation and then how, do you, how can you be a planner versus the provider of transportation? The other thing that we try to do is to get really creative. Um, uh, and some of the things that I've heard people do is to create an I need a ride network. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with WhatsApp, but we use it for everything um, from our staff communications to, um, you know, to developing these I need a ride network. Um, so it's, you know, for, for an individual, we would have, you know, if, if the person needed to, wanted to go to church or the person wanted to go to see a movie on Saturday and lived really, really far out, um, you know, what they do is put it up and say, you know, I, I want to go see this movie and it blasts out to this little WhatsApp group um, and, um, you know, you put in there people who that person trusts and people that um, are connected to them um, and, uh, you know, it goes out to everyone. You can even include the provider, um, you know, and, and it says, you know, I need a ride to a medical appointment. I need a ride to the movies. I need a ride to the the baseball game, I need a ride to work, whatever it is, and you and you put, uh, you know, pull that network together, and it blasts out, and then you, you can see the response. So you can see if someone says, you know, I could do that for you. So uh, very creative use of technology, um, creating a ride cooperative, like a carpooling uh, uh, situation for the program, um, might be something that you would do. Um, and you could pull in families, or you could pull in, uh, you know, staff people. Um, uh, uh, to, to participate, um, you know, people who live close to somebody, um, if you're in a, in a more rural setting. Um, I, the other thing that we've heard that is, is very, very interesting is, you know, countywide transit share. And this was something out of Hudson, Wisconsin, which is kind of a bedroom community of Minneapolis. And what they found was that there, you know, there a million places had vans um, that weren't being utilized throughout the day. Um, so they started kind of putting together and the county picked it up and said, you know, we have a lot of people, both, you know, seniors who don't drive anymore and people with disabilities who need, uh, you know, a flexible transit system and we have no buses. So they created this pool of transit share vehicles and the county supports it and the county throws a little money in and anybody can participate and they kind of tied it together. Um, 
and uh, the the county um, had some sort of um, technology, you know, request thing, um, and and it's allowed, um, you know, it, it's taken the the because other people were like, you know, well, is these and schools participate in it and other things, and um, and they've signed, you know, these they've signed these waivers and and these cooperative, um, you know, transit share things, and they've created this whole network um, that just isn't relying on one provider, but allows all all providers to pick up, you know, a variety of people. Um, obviously, with you know, if you're if you're dealing with younger students and things like that, that's not so good. But uh, at transition age, um, parents can sign off, and and um, uh, young adults can participate in this transit share. So, lots of lots of issues. But again, if you if you sit down with a group, you can put your heads together and come up with some some interesting things. Um, the other thing that I've seen that has, has worked, I was in a in a very very rural area in Wisconsin, and and they we were talking about challenges, and and the one that they didn't bring up was transportation. So I was kind of like, what do you you know you're missing one, you're missing one, and I kept saying, well, what about what about no, yeah, no, there's one missing, and they they finally said, well, what what is it? What what are we forgetting? And I said, what about transportation? And they said, "Oh, that's not a problem." And I almost fell out of my chair. And I said, "You know, what? Do you, you are the only program I have ever heard, and you're in the middle of nowhere." And I'm like, "You know, what? What? A, do, you know, do people have personal helicopters or you know, you know, chauffeurs? You know, what? Why is this not a problem up here?" And they said, "Well, we we have re we realize that you know we live in a really rural community, and that people are going to have to rely on their networks." So, these, so what we do is we really um, you know post. Uh, requests and they they you know they were the ones that were you know, the I need a ride network kind of thing only it was more church bulletins com company break rooms um, and you know and WhatsApp so that they could you know kind of get at um, you know can you give me a ride here um, and and um, and they 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 said that it's worked really really well and, and that people are able to get to places and do things and 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 that they've seen that they get really that they develop friendships um, with their coworkers and with their you know the other people in their churches and other things. So um, really looking at you know a person's personal networks. Um, the other thing that I've I've heard of is you know there's there are programs that are teaching people how to ride bikes. Um, and then another piece that people are, are, our providers are looking at is paying staff to drive their own cars. So if you have a staff person who lives in the same community as, as an individual who's, who lives way far out, paying them to go um, get that person and bring them into a more central location um, uh, is, is, is a way to deal with that. Another thing that people are looking at is, you know, these small vehicles. Um, this is a six passenger suburban kind of thing that doesn't look like a, you know, big, 15 passenger van with you know the you know being independent stamped on the side um so uh this this is also uh, a van that the door opens up and you can get a it, a little ramp comes out the two doors open up and um the person can drive a wheelchair in and and they sit they ride shotguns so they ride right next to the driver and this was franklin county's uh board of developmental services and they they bought a whole fleet of these because they love them so much um and one of the guys had had uh gone out for the first time ever in it and he's he came back and he said i am 43 years old and i've never been in the front seat of a car and he was just completely flummoxed and and um, you know, so excited by it, um, and it, and he, you know, for 43 years he had been tied up and secured in the back of a 15-passenger a van or even bigger. I think it was a school bus, and couldn't talk to people, couldn't really see where he was going, couldn't, you know. And this was the first time he was kind of sitting next to the driver and with everybody around him, and it was it was just a totally different feel um, from being out in the community. Um, in this in this kind of vehicle from you know a, a 15 passenger van. Obviously, the uh, communication is key. So you you want to you want to really get your team together. You want to have staff meetings at least twice a month, um, and really uh, you know go over um, key issues. Make sure that it's, the agenda is quite clear and that you stay um, on t on topic because you know people get together and they can tend to spend the entire time socializing. So you know we we make it. Uh, a little fun, but we also make it 
um, an opportunity to really problem solve. Um, cell phones are key um, for staff and participants, so making sure that you know you encourage. Um, and if parents are reticent, we we say to them, this is a lifeline. You know, we're really looking at teaching them to utilize this. If they get lost, you could put GPS on it to make sure that you know you can track where the person is all the time. And it's a way to really encourage independence. Um, so you know, we we encourage families to get people um, cell phones. Um, and then, you know, obviously staff, we have a cell phone policy um, that, um, uh, you know, that we pay for some of the, our staff can either, uh, we have we have work link phones or if they, if some, some of the people don't want to carry their own um, or don't want to carry two or whatever. So we have a policy that um, pays for a portion of their plan. Um, the other thing that we're looking at is, you know, weekly staff and individual schedules, and those are printed. Those go out to the individual and their families, and they go out to the staff, so everybody's on board and knows, you know, who's who's on first base, and and to make sure that, you know, everybody's clear as to who goes who goes where. Um, the other thing that we look at is Cloudware. So there's their app, there's Setworks, there's a lot of new softwares coming out for client records and daily documentation so that it makes it easy for staff who are out in the field to really um, uh, um, do what they need to do as far as uh, Title 17 regulations and such, um, and also to keep it uh, safe and secure. Um, the other thing that we look at is, uh, you know, how do we communicate as a team? And one of the things that we absolutely adore is WhatsApp. Which is a uh, encrypted service, so you know you assign, you can create a WhatsApp group. We have one for the entire WorkLink team. We have one for um, the employment services team. We have one for the community services team, um, and then you can WhatsApp individuals um, who are you know who are on your on your um, list. So uh, people can communicate in a very effective way, and it's really pulled the team together. We really. It's 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 amazing, you know. When something really cool happens, someone will post a picture, and you know, here's here's Stephen on his first day at work, and everybody can feel a part of that um, because people are out and about, and and um, so community instructors, when people are doing some things that are really fun and and exciting, they they post pictures, or they you know, if someone's out at a dentist uh, or gets sick or whatever, we can post. You know, so and so is out today. They're not going to be in. So it's a way to really communicate. It's a way to really tie your team together, and it's a really way, a, a great way to kind of celebrate successes and and to share, um, you know, what people are doing. So, and we we also like to encourage independence in community settings. So, you know, we re really look at collecting data on on. Uh, the level of independence. Um, again, we use uh, task analysis for street crossing and really look at hard numbers, not qualitative statements. Johnny did a good job crossing the street. It doesn't fly. Um, we also look at encouraging independence through teaching problem solving, and I talked about um, you know that let's get lost um, and fading support slowly. We don't do a dump and run. Um, so really, kind of looking at how do we how do we manage it in a in a in a, in a very slow and gradual process. The other thing that we look at is really using technology. So, you know, um, and I talked about cell phones being that, that kind of lifeline um, and making sure that people know how to call their friends on that and know how to call us on that and know how to call their family on that. Um, and we how to set up alarms and, and um, we put checklists together and things like that. The other thing that we do is uh, we use peer mentors uh, for small steps. So, you know, teaching them to be out with each other. Um, you know, so we may have uh, a person, a peer mentor, or what we, we refer to as a peer ambassador, take someone um, who has just learned to travel independently. The next step would be for them to go with a peer ambassador, you know, a few blocks down the, the street to something that they're doing, so th or ride a bus to City College together, um, so that they're with a, with, a, with a friend and a peer who knows how to do it well. Um, and they they love it. They love being out without without some silly work link person looking over their shoulder. Um, so the other thing that we do is to celebrate that independence, and we have a wall of fame. Um, the other thing uh, that I would encourage people to do is when your services fade, is to really sign off and make sure that you um, everyone's in agreement that this person's. Uh, and and one example is we have a travel affidavit, so that when someone is independent and in traveling. 
um, we have the person, we have the everybody, the the social worker, the person, the family sign off saying this person's got this, um, and that WorkLink is no longer going to be responsible for um, providing travel support um, on this route or for this person, um, or if someone comes in and they've been uh, independently traveling all over San Francisco by themselves, uh, we can have them sign that right from the get-go. And then what we can do is show them their routes, but you know we don't have to really support them in, as far as training and stuff. Um, and I can show that to you. It looks like this. Um, and I can actually, I, I thought it was going to be one of the handouts, but I will make sure that we get that out to them. Right, Stacy? Um, so um, this is what it looks like, and you can see it's just a sign-off sheet um, that states kind of what the person's needs are around traveling and, or that they're independent. And then how do we measure success? Again, we're looking for outcomes um, that are important. We're really looking at financial security. Um, you know, do they, how many hours do they work? How much money do they make? Uh, we look at the, you know, community engagement is another piece that we're like, you know, how, how engaged are they? Are, you know, are they sitting home? Does their schedule look like that big green block? Because that's not what we want. So really looking at, you know, how do you measure what's important? Um, the uh, independence, the hours of service. You can look at, you know, the, the accomplishments of goals. You can also count, um, you know, use the supports intensity scale, assist with through AIDD um, that, uh, you know, some states use to kind of score people for the eligibility of services. You could actually pull that in and, or create some sort of adaptive behavioral scale that you could look at. We look at our, um, and that's where our community skills assessment came in, and that's something that we look at on an annual basis is, is are they going from, you know, ones and twos to twos and threes, or are they going from threes and fours to fours and fives? You know, are we seeing some sort of progress on that scale? The other thing that we look at is their friends and connections. Um, you can also look at, you know, health. Are they are they maintaining or losing weight? Are are they managing diabetes without insulin? You know, are they are they is their endurance and stamina increasing? Um, you know, do and then the other outcome that's really important is, you know, do they have a clean, comfortable, happy, happy home? So really looking at, you know, can they can they um, manage uh, various things around their house, like can they vacuum, can they wash dishes, can they cook, can they clean, um, do they have a garden, do they want pets, you know, how, how can you make their house feel like something that's that's their own. So as a, on a programmatic level, you know, one of the things that you as managers would want to be looking at is the percent of people engaged in community activities, and of course you would hope to God that those were targeted activities and not just going to the park. Um, and you look at uh, one of the things you could also look at is connections or you know the number of friends that people have and you could you know say to someone who are your friends and I bet the first year you say it it's going to be staff people um, and paid staff and, and that's it um, and then over the course of time if you start hearing names of people that are out in the community and and you know are you doing things with your friends what are you doing are you doing things without us you could count those those instances um, and that to me would be a measure of success so if you went from zero for people doing things out without us to you know 15 or 16 people doing things without us that's that would show good uh, progress um, the other thing that you would be wanting to look at, of course, is, is the number of people working in community integrated employment um, and what percentage of the people in your program are in that. Um, programs have also looked at the number of months from enrollment to placement and placement to stabilization. You know, how fast are you getting to that? And, and with community day services, what my hope would be is that, you know, you would be able to really get people enrolled in your employment services and 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 tailor this down because you know people would be um, well prepared and that discovery upfront work would all be done so the you know enrollment to placement should really drop um, and then you know uh, and then placement to stabilization should also drop in hours because you've got people who are out in the community doing all sorts of great things and are are familiar and comfortable and um, you're working on hygiene and social skills and all of that stuff is taken care of and, and being worked on and, and addressed prior to um, putting people in in a, in a job situation. So um, 
uh, my guess would be that there would be less less issues to deal with, um, and you know, getting someone to stabilization would be much faster. Um, the other thing that you could look at programmatically is you know wages and hours. Um, what's the average wage and hours uh, for people, and you do you see that increasing annually? Um, the other thing that you could look at is retention, obviously, and career growth and customer satisfaction. So I, in the last one, talked about scatter plots and how we use those to really look at two factors. One is um, the level of employment someone is at and the community engagement. And if you look at webinar number two, it, it'll go through that. Um, we don't have time to kind of repeat this. Uh, but one of the other elements of that was that we would we use this on, a, on an annual basis. Uh, for WorkLink, and we look at, you know, one, this is the individual, so we we do a, a scatter plot on Anna, so at intake, what is her level of independence in the community, and that's based on that skills assessment, and then what's her level of employment, and I provided those levels um, uh, and can certainly put those out as a handout again, um, but, you know, what's a one, what's a two, what's a three in employment, um, and then what we look at is, on an annual basis, is she making progress? We also plot where people are at as on a programmatic level. So we look at the entire program for WorkLink, where are people? And what we see is, you know, from 2016 to 2017, are we starting to see people moving up and out? So are we seeing more fours and fives? And are, are people kind of clustering in different, you know, in, in more of the three, four, five area than the one, two, three area? So you can look on an annual basis, 2016, 2017, you can see that people are moving up and out. Um, the other thing that we look at is client input. You know, how are we doing? And one of the things that we've created is a consumer advisory council with elected officials. And, and again, these are our peer mentors and our ambassadors, and we tap them for all sorts of things. Um, and they they uh, advise leadership and and talk about you know what they want from our program services. Um, they provide input on staff evaluations. They generate ideas for new services. We have a blow your mind board that they put things up that they want to do, and it can be anything from um, you know d doing a um, going to Disneyland to you know whatever it is that they they that ex somebody somebody put up there riding a motorcycle. I don't know how we're going to pull that off, but. Um, so, you know, generating ideas for, you know, things that they want to do um, and new services. And then the other thing that we've made them responsible for is, is safety training and office inspections. Um, so they, they participate in making sure that, you know, we follow our car for accreditation safety inspections and we made them in, in charge of training their peers um, and doing safety trainings in, in uh, we do January and July, and in July they're responsible for doing a peer training um, on uh, you know what to do in an emergency um, or in a natural disaster, or they they choose it. Um, and then of course they're peer ambassadors. So I wanted to leave a little time uh, for questions and also for Stacy. And I can see I didn't leave very much time for <laughs> Stacy. That's um, okay. But Actually, what you can do is um, Sarah is. If you want to skip ahead to the webinar page that gives the date and time for the Maryland specific, because I think that's the most important thing. So for anybody on this webinar um, that's interested in tuning in to next week's webinar that's scheduled for July 24th at 10 o'clock, that's going to be able. That's going to be me providing more of an in-depth walkthrough of Maryland's meaningful day services. Um, really giving information related to our transformation, our new employment services that are planned to phase in July of 2019. So for anybody that hasn't had a chance to sign up for that, you can go to DDA's website and click on our training calendar for the month of July, and you can um, you can register right there. Uh, by going on the calendar. But I, I, I want to just be able to get to questions because several people posted some questions. First, people that asked about the handouts, let me just remind you that the PowerPoint that was presented today is available by going to the handout uh, tab in your control panel. The, uh, the skills assessment that Sarah referenced as well as the positive personal profile are both on our website and they are right underneath the the other, the first two webinars that were 
recorded and are on our webinar page on the DDA website, so you can find both of those. The final form, the affidavit form that, um, that Sarah referenced, we will upload with this webinar once the recording is completed and we get it on the website. So anybody that asked about handouts, everything is available or will be available once we get it on the website. So Sarah, we did get a few questions and let me go back and some of them you may have touched on. Uh, one of the challenges I find for true person-centered planning is that many individuals are e easily influenced by their staff and or families. So unless there's a real commitment to find out what the person wants, you get choices based on other suggestions. How do your staff, how do you train staff and monitor individual plans to make sure it's person-centered? Well, I think one of the things that we 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 need to consider, and especially with people with more significant disabilities, is they are a, an integral part of their family, um, and and um, families are an integral part of this. And I think that that's one of the beauties of that life course um, training. And uh, they they don't see the family as something to overcome. And I think we as providers, you know, we we get our, all all head up, and you know, they, and I think what we need to do is start looking at people within the within the the realm of their family and trying to figure out why is it that the family is reticent or what is the situation and oftentimes it's because they see it as a disruption they see it as you know I can't I can't manage that um, or it's, you know, you're, you're putting this on me. Um, so we have to kind of figure out what, what is causing the family to be reticent and the family not to support this and, and, um, and address that in a, in a collaborative way. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, really understanding the, fi the family dynamics and the lifespan and the, 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 the situation at home. Um, you know, because oftentimes too, we get we get families who have you know having someone with a disability, especially a significant disability, uh, and as they age and as they you know retire and as they get older, they they get tired, and they they just you know they don't they don't have the ability to support or or you know do what they did, and um, so really making sure that you're evaluating that. Um, and really figuring out how to uh, support not just the individual, but but their but their their family unit and them in their family unit, so that we're not you know creating these isolated uh, divisions of of support, but that we're really creating something that's going to look more holistically at the person. Um, is that does that answer that question? <laughs> yeah, I, I think it did. And just another word that Maryland also um, has an initiative of supporting families, and we utilize the Charting the Life course tools and have um, communities of practice around that initiative throughout Maryland. So on next week's webinar, I'll make sure to provide resources related to that as well. Um, the next right. question. One of the oh, one of the other things I wanted to to kind of say it in lines with that is is that um, you know oftentimes families you know the only time that providers call is when there's bad news or you know worse we're you know we're throwing your kid out so you know they they run from the idea that you know the the providers are calling so we have to get away from that and we have to really kind of call people when there's great things happening and we need to convey kind of the successes and and to you know to really make sure that families see us as as part of their network and a part of you know not just someone who's coming in and telling them what to do and and um, you know make sure that it's not going to be bad news every time we call right absolutely next question what would be some recommendations for students and parents transitioning from school to adult services and the community-based service model do you have any thoughts on how it might be different for students transitioning in as opposed to maybe an older adult? Um, well, you're dealing with different things. Um, oftentimes, students uh, aren't used to being in, a, in, a, in an adult service facility-based program, so you, you're not, you know, kind of bucking up against all of those years of, and, and the expectations are higher. So many times you'll see families that expect their son or daughter is going to work and don't know any different. Um, so, you know, oftentimes we see that with, at transition age, it's, 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 it's often easier because um, 
the, the families aren't used to being, you know, everything's taken care of. And, and um, in a program, it looks very much like school. You know, the bus comes, picks up the, my son or daughter, and they go. And that's the last thing we want to encourage um, going forward. So, you know, I think it's easier with transition age students to make that um, to make that change and to and to say okay you know these are how services look now um, and you know what we're trying to do is to create an independent adult life for your son or daughter and how do we do that together um, is the is the message for older people um, you you are getting over uh, probably a lot of uh, there, there, there's years of this is what's good for your son or daughter is to put them in this center and, and you know, it's not safe in the community and, and they need to be in these special services. They can't work, so we're going to create this, you know, facility-based workshop so they can experience uh, employment. You know, so there, there's a lot of things that we told families ages ago and, and now we're telling them something that's completely different. So, you're, you know, they don't trust us. <laughs> so, so you're dealing with a a lot of older families who are like, you know, I'm 88 years old and you're pulling the rug out, of, out from under me right now. You know, so the, you, there's a lot of uh, different um, issues. Um, and I think with older families, you're going to have to go slower. I think you're going to have to, you know, um, start in, um, you know, non-threatening ways. Um, I think you're going to have to actually kind of encourage the person to kind of lead this, uh, the individual themselves to kind of say to their parents, I want this. Um, uh, cause you know, they, they have been listening to, 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 uh, experts for years and, and now we're saying something completely different than they've been told. So, um, you know, we need to really kind of consider that as we move into the community and as we kind of encourage and, and explain and, um, provide these options for people. Thank you. And we have a question. It's a pretty lengthy question, so I'm going to try to consolidate for time's sake, but it really gets to the piece about kind of the complexity of um, making sure all the logistics related to these community-based services happen well every day. How do you keep things running smoothly? This person that's asking the question is very frustrated, trying to work out all the details. He says it's difficult to even uh, take a vacation because there are too many details to work out when I'm not there. How does everyone else manage the stress of trying to provide the services for community integration, um, but rarely have enough staff to do what you have planned? Um, so any thoughts on that? I, I do recognize it's certainly a different complexity than when, if you're talking about a facility-based service model. Right. Um, and and uh, the, a big problem is, is that many of the providers um, have one foot on the dock and one foot in the boat as far as service transformation. So they're trying to maintain their pro their production centers and their facilities while they gun up these community-based programs. So your, your resources are being pulled in two very different directions. Um, and um, so that's one of the, the key problematic aspects. So really looking for, you know, can you get some outside funding to really gun up the community-based staff? There's also a lot of upfront stuff that needs to be done as far as setting up and establishing uh, community sites and community relationships and partnerships um, that need to be done, and it's very labor-intensive. So, you know, really, the I, I can say, you know, we've been doing it for 21 years, and the first two years were just God awful because we didn't have the relationships, we didn't have the partnerships, we didn't know what we were doing, um, and over time things got into a pattern and things got into you know well this is the process and this is what we need to do and this is uh, you know obviously we need to do this so you you learn and you develop what you you know your staff gets used to being out in the community and gets used to being teaching in the community. Um, so the first two years um, are a little rocky and then oftentimes people start with a pilot and they don't have a critical mass. So you're dealing with, you know, we have four people in the program. And, you know, how do you individualize a group schedule for four people and, you know, they're going to end up doing something that they don't want to do. And I think what we need to try and not beat ourselves up over is that, you know, everything is completely meaningful for this person. You know, that's the goal. But if you have one or two things that are completely meaningful, and Stacy, you shared a, 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 a 
story about a young man who who went swimming. Um, and that was something that was he really enjoyed. And there was a picture of him that just, you know, his smile just kind of lights up the world. Um, so if you can start with the one thing that this person wants and can we make that happen and not worry so much about everything is going to be meaningful. Um, and you can slowly, slowly build the schedules so that they are more personalized as you get critical mass, as you start getting more and more people enrolled. Um, you, you will have, it gets easier and easier. And then once you get these community relationships developed, it gets easier and easier. So, um, you know, you, you got to keep fighting through the first couple years where you're really developing kind of your community chops, so to speak. Um, and then, you know, getting getting that critical mass where you've got, uh, you know, groupings that you can put together that are meaningful for everybody in the group. And there's a reason for everybody in the group to be in it. Um, but, you know, it, it it is very very hard. It is you know the 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 flux um, is is difficult. Uh, you know we have significant turnover in this field, so you know that is always problematic. Um, but you know I I again have staff who have been with me for 10, 15 years who who say you know this is the only job I can do now, and that I've ruined them because it's so amazingly fun and fun to be part of changing someone's life. Sarah, I just wanted to throw in related to that same question, something that comes to mind is if you're when you're thinking about how your organization is going to be structured differently to support these type of activities, that while it's important to have sort of that what you call the uh, air traffic controller and the program manager that's that's doing a lot of that coordination, that it really the success is really going to depend on giving empowerment to your direct support staff to take on a different right. role of being able to make decisions on the fly and use good critical thinking and, and expecting that. that yeah right and because it, it will absolutely things will go wrong things will be closed when you didn't think they would be a, a car will break down all of that stuff and so having backup plans and having things so that there doesn't have to be a touch point every five minutes can help a little bit with with that and that takes time to to build those skills in in staff that maybe haven't had to make those kind of decisions in the past right and it, and to be okay with it things are not going to go smoothly and to right. you know just and just to say okay that that, that was right. a complete disaster uh how do we not make that happen like that and there, again there's a beauty in some of that messiness yeah. too yeah, and yeah. that's where a lot of learning happens for all of us so I'm not advocating that we want every day to be a mess but there is something to be said for the dignity right. of having a messy yeah. day once in a while but the, 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 then again the consistency of those schedules is so critical because if you change things every week and you're going someplace new and different every week people are not going to know how to get there people are not going to know what to do when they get there people are going to be discombobulated and out of sorts but if you create kind of the structure and consistency and many of the people that we work with love structure and love to know what I'm going to be doing tomorrow and with who and you know for many of them it's it's really important to put that in play Absolutely. So, you know, those well, weekly schedules are, 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 they don't change significantly. I mean, you know, they're, they're little things do, but, and, you know, it's not something that you can write and put in plan and say that that's going to be there in a year. But, you know, you, it, you know, we try to keep them very structured and consistent so that it's not, you know, complete shake up every week. Right. Agreed. So I, I see we have some resources on the page. Again, for those of you that are, have been able to download the document, there were a couple questions. People were unable to locate the handout um, tab on the right-hand side of the screen. Um, if you're unable to to, to find it, um, the, the webinar will be sent out in an email next week once the recording is finished. Um, so if you still are unable, unable to find it, you still have a, a way to access it. And again, it will be also on our website. So um, you'll have an opportunity to get all of these resources. Sarah's contact information is on the screen. Um, and I'm sorry we went over a little bit, but I wanted to make sure Sarah had a chance to, to answer any questions. And Sarah, just on behalf of Maryland and, and all of our stakeholders, I want to sincerely thank you for this series. I think it's been extremely beneficial. We really value um, hearing about your work, um, about your experiences, and um, and thank you very much for your time and energy on this. Uh, you are all so welcome. And all right. feel free to reach out and call me if people have questions. Excellent. Thank you. And thank you, everybody. Have a great weekend. 
bye everyone.